Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Nicole Quinn, and I'm here with Dr. Daylon James, co-host of the Stem Cell Podcast. Welcome to the Lab Coats and Life Podcast, where we help scientists thrive. The Lab Coats and Life Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life sciences research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Lab Coats and Life podcast, rate us and leave us a review. You can also suggest ideas or recommend guests for new episodes. Today, we have Dr. Richard Sever from Cold Spring Harbor on the podcast to talk about his experience in open access publishing. Richard Sever is an assistant director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press in New York and co-founder of the preprint server BioArchive. He also acts as an executive editor for the Cold Spring Harbor Perspectives and Cold Spring Harbor Protocols Journals. After receiving a degree in biochemistry from Oxford University, Richard obtained his PhD at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, UK. He then moved into editorial work, serving as an editor at Current Opinion in Cell Biology and later Trends in Biochemical Sciences. He subsequently served as an executive editor of the Journal of Cell Science before moving to Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in 2008. But before we get to that... Did you know that the Lab Coats and Life podcast is part of Stem Cell Technologies mentorship resources? Would you like to learn more about practical soft skills to help you communicate your science and read up on current trends and efforts in the scientific community? Visit www.stemcell.com slash labcoatsandlife to find articles, free downloadable checklists, and more to help you thrive in science. All right, Dr. Sever, thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Lab Coats in Life. It's a, a unique format for me, but I'm really excited about it because moving outside of my wheelhouse of, you know, strictly stem cell science, I actually get to talk to scientists and leaders in the field who have moved the needle uh, in one way or another that can really help trainees and all scientists. So I'm really excited to have this chance to talk to you about your input and your impact in the field. And I don't want to, you know, steal your thunder there. Why don't you explain in your own words uh, what your research focus and just general focus uh, and impact in the scientific field is? Um, okay, yeah, well, so um, thank you very much for inviting me to be on. Um, I'm, I'm one of those people who left the lab, left the lab pretty soon after doing a PhD. Um, so most of my, most of my sort of working life has been as an editor of journals and I worked on several of them. Um, but most recently, I think what I've been spending a lot of my time on has been um, preprint servers and specifically um, the preprint server BioArchive, which, you know, now now has a sibling MedArchive, but it's um, it's kind of an opportune time to, to, to chat with you guys because we just uh, celebrated our 10th anniversary and it's kind of interesting looking back you know i think there's quite a few people who didn't think we would ever get to 10 so you know it's a it's a nice time to chat and and of course for celebration really richard i um i have to say i went to the AAAS uh meeting i think it must have been 2016 or 17 and i'm not sure if it was you that i saw or or one of your co-founders of bioarchive but there was a big um panel discussion about open access and preprints. And it was the first time I'd ever heard of a preprint. Uh, and I remember hearing of this, and, and of course I called it bio X Riv or something. When I first, <laughs> it's like, I'm sure you get a lot uh, when I first saw it. And I I was one of those people who was like, I, I, I mean, I hope it works, but I don't know if it's going to. So um, congrats on 10 years. It's it's made a huge, a huge impact to the way science is communicated. And I'd love to hear, um, you know, maybe just give us a little walk down memory lane. How did this start? Uh, what were some of the milestones and hurdles along the way? And maybe just like a, a quick, you know, where are we now with BioArchive and MedArchive? Um, and how is it sort of fitting into the scientific communication landscape? Yeah, well, I mean, where are we now? We we have um, more than a quarter of a million preprints across BioArchive and MedArchive. So that's a sort of nice landmark to pass on after 10 years. Um, how we got there is, is, is uh, yeah, it's been an interesting journey. And, and as I said, it's been a journey that, you know, sort of um, you couldn't necessarily have kind of forecast how things would have gone. I mean, one thing that we could say is, you know, it's really important to remember that um, BioArchive was predated by Archive 
in physics and sort of computational science and math, and they'd been doing it for a long time. You know, that started in 1991 with Paul Ginsberg, who um, who launched um, launched Archive, um, and there were a kind of a number of conversations over the years about you know could this be done in in biology could this be done in medicine and a lot of people said no you know that you know and it's kind of interesting to, to think about and, and not only did people say no people tried and they failed um and then we launched bioarchive in 2013 and it's kind of interesting to think about why it succeeded um i think one of the one of the things that people had said in the past was biology is different you know it's you know physics produces these easily verifiable conclusions it's you, you do your stuff you write qed at the end um and biology is really messy it's completely different it won't work in biology everybody will just get totally confused the field will disintegrate and then it was interesting talking to people like paul who said well these people don't know anything about physics physics is not easily ver verifiable it's it, it's messy too um and we were lucky being in Cold Spring Harbor because we had people who'd been physicists who had become biologists. And so they were like, well, you, you guys are crazy that you ought to be doing this in biology as well. Um, it, it's no different. It will work here too. So I think there's, there's that. And then there was a lot of fear about how journals might react. Um, and I think that was in, for, for the individual users, people were worried, oh, if I, you know, if I put a preprint online, will suddenly all the journals say, well, we're not going to look at it. This is previously published. So that was a big fear. And that fear for some people continues to this day, even though in the interim, it became very clear that all the journals um, pretty much were like, yeah, we, we've not only are we fine with this, but we kind of have to be fine with this because the, the, the movement is growing. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think that was in terms of memory lane, the key thing for me was talking to these people who were who had been physicists and mathematicians and were now biologists. And they said, you know, you guys absolutely should be doing this. Um, so that was a real turning point for me. Um, and, um, you know, my my colleague, John Ingalls, and I sort of talked more and more about this idea and decided, decided to, to, to give it a go and taking a lot of soundings from, from within the community um and uh and we got a lot of kind of good reception in particularly in the population genetics community it was clear that they had been thinking about this too and and i think there's a sort of general level of dissatisfaction with science publishing that everybody hears about um and in particular it takes so long mm. you know people were you know you go to a you go to a conference and you hear somebody put, uh, talking about work and you're like wow that's that's amazing but then you know the paper would appear a year later and you know i think people were just generally thinking you know with the world wide web why does it have to be like this and of course the answer is it, it doesn't and that you can decouple that the making the information available from the process of peer review and that had all been kind of conflated in, in the in the journal world um so that's that's kind of how we how we started and and you know a lot of scientists voted with their feet particularly in genomics evolutionary biology um computational neuroscience um and so there was a wave of of, of those kinds of people got involved started posting papers on bioarchive and then you know there's a kind of like almost a kind of like osmotic process throughout the community and you know somebody who's a stem cell biologist would say oh you know i just read this kind of genomics paper about some aspect of development. And then you've got a lot of people um, in developmental biology and cell biology beginning to do it. Um, and then funders beginning to say, hey, this is a good thing and, and, and you should be doing this. Um, and of course that became most evident when we, um, when we got to the pandemic. Um, in the pandemic by, you know, sort of luck more than judgment, we had launched MedArchive for clinical information six months before, you know, expecting that it would have a sort of slow growth like BioArchive did and, and ramp up over um, a number of years. And, you know, six months later, there were 10 million people looking at it every month and we had 4,000 papers because, you know, everybody, everybody understood that, you know, for, for COVID work and understanding the virus, getting the information out really, really quickly was, was, was really important. So that became a real demonstration um, of, the, um, of, of the effectiveness um, and, and, you know, and, and a demonstration that it could work in medicine, because that was another thing. We, MedArchive 
so we were intentionally came a number of years after bioarchive mm -hmm. yeah we didn't have a year to i think a year is generous when you say it takes a year to publish i think it's sometimes a lot more uh than that and i've always lamented about how you know it takes so long to do the science and then and then to actually get it out there takes takes forever and you mentioned uh conferences and you know we're lucky if we see something at a conference conferences are a pretty exclusive place to be as well so you know really things were, were hidden for quite some time yeah i mean i'm just i guess uh you underscored it there both of you it's the the speed right the question being why why do we need a preprint server? I think one of the major responses to that is that, yeah, it takes too long to get the stuff out. Um, and I, I heard you uh, in a talk you gave online talk about um, how Steve Quake at the Biohub had done some back of the envelope calculations and, and kind of came around to the, the idea that, that preprints can accelerate science roughly 5x over the course of a decade, right? And it's, it's obvious why it's seed collaboration um, and also ancillary benefits, young scientists, visibility, there's no paywall on these preprints, right? Um, so yeah, it seems like a, a no brainer in terms of, of the why, and we've addressed that. Uh, but you know, there's the counter argument that I think a lot of people make about speed also considered as like haste or, or maybe the work is a little bit less vetted or, or less rigor. Um, it's more about just getting it out there, making the claim than actually supporting it. Right. So uh, what what are the, the, the I'm sure there's been a lot of a lot of haters out there who've been telling you why it's a bad idea or why it's going to fail or how it's going to lower the, the standard or whatever it is. Um, what's your response to those? And, and do they have any now, years later? Is there any like evidence to point to it so they can say, you know, in the same way that it's difficult to say, hey, look. This science has been accelerated in the last 10 years by 5x. It's, it's hard. We don't have a, you know, control there. When people say the reverse and talk about the muddying of the waters or the reduction of rigor, is anyone pointing towards any specific evidence? Or are they all just saying uh, this could happen? What, what are the arguments that you hear against the preprint? Well, I mean, I think the noise is the noise is a it, it is a concern. Um, I think the possibility that there's information out there that is wrong is a, is a concern. But uh, you know, I mean, I my feeling um, is that that is already the case without preprints. Um, you know, I mean, I, I there's a, with one anecdote with that I think it illustrates it perfectly. As I I was when 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 we were planning. Uh, med archives and, and launch med archives. I was talking to my dad, who's a you know a sort of older generation physician about this, and he sort of said to me, you know, um, well, you know, and I, I get what you're doing with bioarchive. I'm not sure about this med archive thing. I I worry about you know the the, the, the potential misinformation, wrong information that's coming out. I, I worry about this. Um, we talked about it a little bit and then he came back to me like about three weeks later i spoke with him on the phone and he said oh you know um i've been thinking about your med archives thing i've decided it isn't a problem actually because all the crap gets published somewhere anyway and you know and i so i think that's how you have to i mean that's i mean it's a sort of it, it, it's flippant and i and i don't want to seem like i don't care about this but i do think we have to set it against the backdrop of the fact that you know you can now put any information on the on the web so there's no way you're not by by not doing preprints you're not stopping things getting out and not only that you can pretty much publish anything somewhere these days there's really been a race to the bottom with journal publications so that you know i mean i was just there was a discussion on on twitter yesterday about, about this sort of dreadful paper that's appeared in a peer-reviewed journal um which everybody thinks is complete nonsense there are lots of examples of that so i think that already exists um and the good thing about a preprint is it comes with a massive sign on the front basically saying this has not been peer reviewed we're not making any claims about it at all it could all be wrong mm. um so i think it focuses people's attention on this on this issue um and um uh, but it's, it's very transparent ab about that aspect i mean and i i do find it um hard to find examples of preprints that that provide evidence that this is a problem i mean i actually find it quite easy to find examples of journal articles which purports to be peer-reviewed and and are incredibly mis misleading so I, I i don't think so and it's also worth 
um, uh, emphasizing that a bioarchive and metarchive, one of our major concerns was always that this might be dangerous, that some papers might be dangerous, and that if they were wrong, there could be bad consequences. And so we do all the paper, I and mean, people sometimes think we just put every paper we get online, but actually everything is looked at by scientists. So there is, it's not peer review, but we look to see whether there's something that's potentially dangerous, particularly dangerous if it were wrong. So, you know, in those cases, we said, we did, we turn, we turn them away. So it's, you know, I think really, it really, really the worry is that, you know, you might read a paper and think, oh, that's pretty good. Um, and it might take you down the wrong direction experimentally. But a lot of the time people point out that the real thing with preprints is that they're being read for the most part by people who are perfectly equipped to peer review them anyway. I mean, people, I mean, it, we talked about conferences a few minutes ago. It's like a conference, but with six billion potential people in the audience. And, and most of the people reading preprints are, I mean, they're, most of them are really arcane bits of science and biology or, 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 or health science. And so most people will, will, will read them, will be experts and will be, will be equipped to evaluate them. And if they aren't, then they should ask somebody else. Um, so I, you know, I find it, I find it hard to point to, to specific, um, uh, very, to specific in, in instances where there's been a problem. Um, and as I say, you know, we, we've always had this in mind. Yeah. I mean, I want to elevate that point because I think that's something that's lost on, on many scientists that I've spoken to about preprints is this idea that it's like a, a pretty much like a beefed up Twitter where everyone could just post whatever they think or whatever they've found, where in fact, there is a screening process. This is science. It's a scientific paper. And I think it's important to emphasize with the Met Archive in particular, that idea that uh, that any kind of misinformation that might be exploited by bad actors is excluded from that process, where, as you said, I mean, sometimes you have peer reviewed journals that are happy to place that. So. Um, I just want to elevate that point to be clear. And also, though, to 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 ask this question, you know, given the the length of time that that the archives have been around, including the original, but bio archive now major imprint and, and many others, uh, as each one of these preprint servers uh, emerges, does it change the kind of the whole like as you get the, the more niche uh, preprint. Does that take away from the pool and bio archive at all? I mean, I know you're not reviewing all of these articles. The volume is too high, but have you noticed any kind of evolution in terms of the content, not the standing, the volume, which has increased, but is the type of articles that are going to bio archive are, are, are changing at all in, in your opinion or that you've seen? Um, well, I mean, so what, there's, there's a couple of ways in which it does change. One is that it's very clear that different disciplines adopt preprints at different rates. So what's interesting is when you look back at the original archive, that it started with the high energy physicists and then the condensed matter physicists came later and various other people. And there's some, there's still some areas of physics which are not huge adopters. And um, we saw something very similar with bioarchive. You know, initially it was mainly genomics and genetics and then the sort of bioinformatics. But as I said, the developmental biologists came along and then the cell biologists. So you do the sort of the the the, the, the sort of the population of papers is, is changing, but mainly because more people are getting on board in, in different subjects. I think there's there's you know there's also a discussion about we find something like 70 to 80 percent of these papers go on to appear in journals um so the question is what's happening with that other 20 percent that 70 to 80 percent figure is calculated after two years so some fraction of the 20 percent will appear in a journal they're just at the tail of i mean you know you mentioned earlier uh, earlier on um nicole that you know it can take more than a year it can i mean i've seen papers where the accepted the weather submitted and accepted date is five years so some of them will be there but there will be a class of paper that doesn't appear in a journal and what what are those some of them may be so bad that they never get into a journal some of them may be kind of um i don't think there's many like that some of them may be papers where you know they morphed and they became part of something else um, but some of them, I think, will be this 
category of paper where people say, I want to get this information out there. I'm done with it now. I don't need to send it to journalists. It doesn't need to be peer reviewed. There's certain types of study where people say that that's enough for me. It's out there for people to read. I'm not going to go through all the peer review. It's not worth it for, for this, this, this information. And I think it's going to be really interesting to watch that fraction. And, and some people predict that that could become 50% of papers. You know, if, if everybody becomes, you know, if we lose this obsession with the sort of branding and impact factor, there may, you know, you may have a lab where they say, look, half the papers, we just put them on bioarchive, the other half, we put them on bioarchive, and then we send them to a journal because we need, we, there's some reason that we need to go through the formal peer review process. Um, and, and clearly during COVID, there was a, there was a certain type of paper where people were like, I want to get this out, I want to get it read fast and by the time by the time it could be peer reviewed it, it, it's going to be totally out of date anyway so we so we saw some kind of and they were pretty variable quality we saw some modeling of the epidemic and you know you kind of get to a point where if you'd start modeling the epidemic in i don't know march of 2020 you know how 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 useful are those predictions if the paper is published in December of 2020. People may just say, you know, at this point. So I think that, that there'll be various reasons um, why there are some papers that, that never move on to formal peer review. And I think it'd be interesting to watch that. I mean, it's always interesting when I talk to scientists about the future of peer review and I say, you know, how many papers should be peer reviewed? And I get answers from naught to 100%. Some people think that peer review is so broken and so wrong that we shouldn't do formal peer review of any papers. Um, and so other people think that, you know, absolutely every single thing should be should be peer reviewed and that, that you know, the entire kind of um, uh, field will disintegrate it, it, if they aren't. So it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting. I think that'll be very interesting to watch over the over the next few years. Just to add to your uh, numbers there, there's also this other kind of paper maybe that I, I was interested in this semi-superconductor thing, LK99, which came out on the bioarchive. And so I looked into it later. And what I found is that there was a series of bioarchive papers that you know uh, nucleated this massive effort across many scientists who ultimately, I wouldn't say debunked, but they showed that it wasn't a superconductor and they explained why not and why the the false result emerged you know they they kind of like figured it all out completely outside of the sphere of peer review it was a it was a true peer review yeah no i think that's the that's the point i think you know it's kind of interesting so that paper was on archive because it's a because it's basically a physics paper but we have had examples on bioarchive for people that have repeated other people's experiment there was a great example by um uh a former Cold Spring Harbor scientist, um, Yaniv Ehrlich, who um, Craig Venter had put a paper, had uh, published a paper in PNAS uh, claiming that um, their group could predict your appearance from your genome sequence. Um, and literally the same day that that appeared in, in PNAS, by the end of the day, um, Yaniv Ehrlich had posted a paper on, um, on, on BioArchive debunking that that finding and he he showed that actually what was the what the what what they were really doing was predicting the what the average ethnicity was of of someone but that was kind of i mean that was a a real time peer review so i think one of the one of the issues is and it's it's funny i i wrote a big article about this for plus biology on the history of um science publishing recently and, and a lot of people kind of they talk about peer review as if you know sort of 3 400 years ago when journals were invented peer review appeared on day one and was practiced like it is today but actually it's a it's a relatively recent invention you know the most most journals only started doing it after the second world war and as you say it's a it's a it's a sort of formal process that's been enacted but actually peer review is the repetition and the analysis over a period of time of work that's really what peer review means and so it, there is a possibility for um, preprint servers to do that because people can replicate the work or fail to replicate the work and, and explain um, uh, of what the problems were. And there've been a, a handful of sort of really great examples of on, on bioarchive where people have done that. Another another one is, um, I don't know if you are familiar with the, um, the tardigrade, this sort of tiny little eukaryote 
Um, but there was a paper in PNAS that said it had huge amounts of uh, horizontal gene transfer, the like of which had never been seen in a eukaryote. Um, and within a kind of like a couple of months, there was a paper on bioarchive, which basically showed that this was this was this was completely wrong, and it was some form of contamination in in the sequencing. And so that was the best the best form of peer review, really, as you say. My notion of that was that tardigrades could. I thought you were going to say they couldn't survive in space. That's what I knew about tardigrades. So I'm, is that still valid? Because I'm really holding on to that one. That's important. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, how, how, so there's Chris. Chris Mason is a New York scientist who's done a lot of work on the epigenetics of space travel. So I'll have to ask him. I, uh, I have a few comments. There's so much in here. Um, the first is going back to what you were saying about you know what percentage of papers should end up in journals. Um, and you, you talked about the race to the bottom and there's just more and more and more journals to, to the point of predatory journals um, that are just trying to trying to publish these things. And, and I think you're right that I've always said, I wish there was a journal of negative results, like what didn't work. And there's not because you have to have a certain amount of impact or a certain um, story to get into a regular peer-reviewed journal. There is actually, I think there actually is a journal like that. And what's interesting is people don't put papers in it because they don't think it will benefit their careers. Right, which is ridiculous. I mean, maybe it won't benefit their careers, but the point is to benefit science, right? <laughs> so we're trying, oh, to, we're trying yeah. to get out there to, so, so, I mean, there's a, there's a huge amount of papers that could, you know, this didn't work, that did, don't go down this road. It didn't, you know, that, that needs to get out there. Um, and then I think you're also uh, onto something there with the, with the small pieces of information. I know with, um, you know, how many, how many little bits of information do you have that don't make it into that big, that big paper that you end up submitting that are still useful pieces of information that should be, you know, learned and used and, and built upon by other scientists. So, um, but I do want to talk a bit about the peer review because, you said uh, you said you know there's there's this spectrum of of perspectives of zero to one hundred percent of papers should be peer reviewed and I would like to flip that question around and say how much of your time, dear scientists, do you, do you want to spend peer reviewing papers uh, because it's a huge endeavor, right? And and I know um, I don't peer review anymore, but back when I was doing research, I would I would actually kind of I dread that invitation of, you know, can you peer review this? Not only because it was a huge time commitment, but because I felt an enormous amount of pressure to get it right, knowing that there's only a couple people that are going to be looking at this. Whereas on a preprint server, you're now doing this crowdsource review, right? So you now have what I would say is is actually true peer review instead of a handful of of selected people. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the future of where peer review might go or should go. Um, and then I have so much was gathering in my mind as you were talking that the last little point there, you spoke about Craig Venter's um, publication getting into PNAS. And I think there is a little bit of, maybe not even a little bit, there's a lot of that where if you have a big name and a big lab and you're, you know, you're going to get into PNAS or Cell or Nature or something like that. And maybe we should be pulling back on that because we should all be you know, subjected to the same scrutiny. So but let's go back to the peer review uh, conversation. I'm interested to hear where you think it should go. Um, you know, what burden should be out there on scientists and, and what is, is BioArchive the type of platform? Like, is that, is that where we should be moving towards entirely? Yeah, I mean, I think so. The, I mean, the great thing about BioArchive is, is it doesn't um, constrain what you do next because it decouples the peer review from the dissemination i think that's where the opportunities are i think you know there's a real um sort of uh, a chance now for people to experiment and ask the question that you're asking what should peer review look like and i've always thought i mean there's a couple of things that immediately spring to mind one is the fact that peer review looks pretty standard whatever field you're in you know you said it to two or three people and then they to make a decision based on you know, basically nagging them for 14 days to say, get me a, a written analysis of this paper. And, you know, I mean, I think, you know, back to what we were saying earlier um, about about peer review, maybe that maybe maybe if the information's out on the preprint server, you have much more freedom, um, both in time 
and and mechanism for peer review you know i always kind of think of you know for the, the, the examples of people doing synthetic biology and building tools maybe the best peer review of those is somebody actually testing them in a lab and you could have and if, if the information is already out there you have the freedom and time to do that because you don't have to do it really quickly because every day you delay is holding up the information out there because it's already there so i think that's kind of interesting um i mean you talked about the um the burden of peer review. I mean, the other thing that I always know is that we have these kind of simultaneous problems at the same time with lots of scientists saying, I'm so burdened with peer review, I'm asked all the time, peer review is broken, the system is overloaded. But then you have a whole, I mean, as a journal editor, I, you know, many journal editors get emails from people saying, I would love to be asked a peer review paper, I never get asked. So there's a lot of early career scientists who are never asked, who would love to be asked. There's lots of people outside Europe and North America who would like to be asked and never asked. So, I mean, that's another example of where where you buy. I mean, it's not necessarily crowdsourcing, but being able to have a much, much, um, a, a much broader net cast would it, it, it could solve some of those problems, increase equity by involving uh, more people and and get us to a point where we can do a better job and decide what exactly it is that peer review is doing, because I think that's the other thing. I mean, um, I mentioned that article I wrote recently, but one of the, the key points of that article is that what we call peer review conflates a huge number of things. You know, there's the level at which your the peer review is examining the science and saying, is this correct? Or do I think it's correct? Um, and then there's the kind of like, is this any good? Is this important? And then it comes, it becomes a kind of becomes a, a filter of some sort you can say i only want to read the good papers so i read the ones in certain journals because i believe the peer review system has put them there and you realize i mean this is what's kind of interesting is that there have been a number of studies that have shown that papers don't most papers don't change very much from being a preprint to being in a peer review journal and so you know the immediate thing is well you know peer review is not doing anything um but, but it is doing something i mean um, and people will argue whether or not it's a good thing it's deciding what journal they go into so even if the even if the um, peer review doesn't change the paper one thing it does is it decides what journal that paper goes into which people use as a filter to read um, and lots of people will dispute whether that's a good filter but it is absolutely is a filter that people people use so i mean again that's something that we could we could look at and say can we now we've decoupled the dissemination and the peer review can we deconflate aspects of peer review that around things like the quality of the article as opposed to the level of broad interest or impact is a word that people throw around um and another point i always want to make is that there are other things that journals and preprint servers do that are important and will be increasingly important around verification of information um, you know we need to, we need to do a better job and it's hard of assume, of you know assuring that this is the right person you know this 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 person who wrote the article did write the article the data in the article are bona fide data data and are not kind of you know created by chat gpt or the latest large language model or something like that um, so there's all sorts of things that I think are not talked about enough about the kinds of evaluation of, of content that are not quite peer reviewed, but maybe increasingly important in a kind of that sort of whole post-truth world. I, I want it before Daylon takes it away. I, I meant to do this earlier. I want to um, direct our audience to that PLOS biology paper that you just published, because I think it's a, it's a really comprehensive history of publishing and has some some nuggets in there for food food for thought on on where things are going next so thank you for for publishing that and um, putting the effort into that i loved reading that and i'm going to quote from the abstract which i think was a, a a nugget that while would seem to maybe be a disincentive to adopt the preprint idea and framework it's it's not mutually exclusive you said Journal brand and impact factor, you were just talking about. Journal brand and impact factor, meaning, meanwhile, become quality proxies. 
that are widely used to filter articles and evaluate scientists in a hyper competitive prestige economy. And I think that last point is what I wanted to focus on is the hyper competitive prestige economy kind of seems like zero sum, right? And that there's a disincentive, there's a, a loss to these, you know, up and coming or esteemed research with their big result. Uh, but it's not mutually exclusive, right? I think what we're talking about here is that you can get it out in a preprint, get your line in the sand, and then you're you're actually arguing that it still is important to review and for like those legacy reasons of of deciding uh, as a proxy for impact and importance, which I honestly I don't love as a scientist, but like it's how we all live and breathe, right? It's how how we you know, advance in our careers as scientists, we we need, I'm afraid, and I would love to live in a world where we don't, but it seems like we need this, these proxies uh, to judge ourselves in this hyper-competitive prestige economy. But it, it raises a question to me that with the, all the, all the uh, preprint servers that are coming out, also another thing I want to point to that article, which I didn't know about, was just the, the idea, which I'm aware of, but I didn't understand the timing of how the big prestige journals, Nature, Science, Cell, kind of gobbled up all the 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 more niche subject matter with their sibling journals, you know, the Cell Stem Cell, the Nature Medicine, Nature Biotech, to the point where now essentially the big three or big four, whatever you want to call it, they own all prestige science, which I think is is a bit of a money grab on the on the publisher's side. I don't know why else they would do that, but. Um, it does raise the question that as a similar thing happens with the preprints, as you get these specialty preprints, is there ultimately going to be a point where you have your prestige preprint, where you know things that get uh, into bioarchive are maybe at a different level of impact than whatever niche, or is it going to remain all comers in perpetuity? Well, I think, you know, I mean, I, I think that the, 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 the one thing that we're, you know, I mean, people, one, one of the things that people sort of said to me early on was, and there are great papers on bioarchive. So it's interesting that way. And the papers are really good. You know, they're, they're better than, you know, plus one or insert whatever dismissive remark that somebody's making. And, and I was like, well, I, I'm glad that there are great papers on bioarchive. But let's just be clear, the goal is not to have only great papers on bioarchive. The goal is to have all the papers on bioarchive and biology and medicine. So that means that on average, they'll be pretty mediocre because most ones are. But what you do is you decouple that filtering. And so maybe you can make it better. Because the real problem that people, I mean, there's a number of problems that people have with you know this idea that if you get a paper in nature, that you get a job immediately. Um, uh, you know, there's the there's the kind of you know should should those kinds of brands be used as the quality proxy? And there's a whole debate about that. But you know, even if you don't have too much problem with the concept itself, you ought to have a problem with the fact that that decision is made really really soon by the opinions of two or three people. And so, you know, even if you, you know, I mean, even if you don't mind that, and a lot of people argue about that, there is the problem that, you know, you have um, this kind of immutable quality indicator that is assigned before anybody gets to read the paper. And that stays, you know, that, you know, 20 years later, that's still a nature paper. And people go, oh, well, it must be a great paper because it was in nature. You know, even if for the previous 19 years, people have said that's garbage, you know, I don't know why it was published in nature. It still has the word nature and, and so you know i mean i think that's one thing we want to get away from but as you say i think people always want proxies and that's one one can't be naive naive about that i mean you i think one of one of another thing that i think people need to be careful of is if you do get away from uh, a, a sort of third party for objective proxies for the for one of a better word you have to be careful. So in that Craig Venter scenario, you, you mentioned Craig Venter gets the paper in PNAS, but if PNAS goes away, then you have to be very worried that people don't say, oh, well, it's a Craig Venter paper, therefore it's good. You know, I mean, that was one of the things that I, you know, I've talk, talked about before is, is that we have that, that whole hyper-competitive prestige economy comes about because 
there's a real narrowing of the pipeline once you get up to permanent academic positions. So everybody is fighting for them. Everybody's fighting for grants. And that is, that is why you have this prestige economy. So uh, simultaneously, people are deluged with information. So they want signals. And if you remove the signal nature, people will find something else. And we should worry that they then say, oh, you know, this is a paper by Craig Venter, or this is from somebody at Harvard. So we have to be aware, aware of those kinds of things. I think the, the, the question is, is whether through this decoupling process, by having more longitudinal assessments, we can get to a point where there are there are better ways and, and things that are more multi-dimensional. So rather than having a brand, you know, which I will, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's kind of amusing to me that, you know, scientists, are, you know, sort of, you know sort of value their objectivity but they turn out to be just as suckers for brand as everybody who buys nike trainers and wears calvin klein underwear do you know what i mean and you know it's it's, it's always interesting to me that whenever nature launches a new journal um, people complain about imp impact factors but before it even gets an impact factor everybody has decided that nature x is the best journal in field x apart from nature and that happens immediately before before they published any papers. And that's, you know, I mean, it's, it's a very, uh, I mean, you know, they're very smart people in nature. They have good editors, et cetera, and they've got a good track record, but it has built the, the brands to become very, very powerful. Um, and, you know, we have to understand that that is a reaction and that's capitalizing on the, the, the academic career structure. And that's the one thing I always think we should be very careful not to lose sight of. Often people point the, the, the finger at publishers or journals, but actually, they're just responding to this, the, 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 the career pyramid and the structure of academia. And, you know, I, I kind of joke that, you know, 50 years ago, people didn't worry about um, the, which journal they got their um, article in because they were guaranteed to get a job anyway. Right, right. I, I, I just... As the director of brand at Stem Cell, you just spoke right to my heart when, when you you know, a brand is how people feel about you. And and I'm always told by my scientist colleagues, well, scientists are trained to like not pay attention to their feelings, and it's really about the data. You know, scientists also buy Apple products and Nike products. And right. You've given a perfect example. Of, you know, our tie to nature and cell and. Um, but but stemming on that, I was just, you know, you, you spoke before to the fact that 70-ish percent of papers on bioarchive end up in journals. Um, so so is it, maybe this is a really naive question, but if I have it, I'm sure somebody else does. Is it the case that um, the journals are now watching bioarchive? And if there's a paper that's getting a lot of traffic comments, attention, are they now going and seeking out the authors and saying, hey, hey, please submit, or like you're, you're pre-approved, like a credit card, <laughs> you know, if you've got good good credit rating, you're pre-approved for X journal if you'd like to submit here, or I don't know, even waiving the exorbitant fees that come. Maybe I don't want to tie that into it, but is that starting to happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is amazing. That happened really, really quickly. I mean, you know, I in, in 20, we launched at the end of 2013 and very early in 2014, I remember being contacted by someone, I think it was, it was a, guy, a guy called Leonid Krugliak, and he sort of showed me an email that was basically said, oh, dear Leonid, we saw your paper on Bioarchive, would you be interested in submitting to redacted name of very high profile journal? And that happened very quickly. And, and of course, you know, I mean, bear in mind that, um, cell science nature have like uh, loads of editors who go around to conferences hearing talks looking at posters trying to find really interesting work and encouraging the authors to submit so obviously they would they would do this and i think that happened that happened pretty quickly and is 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 quite common um i think the challenge is is that you know that's a very targeted approach by sort of smart editors who think this is good science the other end of the spectrum is there are clearly pr predatory journals who basically will email everybody who posts on bioarchive saying, oh, I loved your paper, please submit. I mean, it's funny, we've all experienced this. I mean, I'm because I'm not an active scientist, I don't publish papers that that often. But you know, the the, the minute that I am 
publish a paper um, like the one you mentioned in PLOS Biology, you know, within the next couple of days, I get, I get an invitation to write a review on forestry or, you know, gastroenterology, all these sorts of things that I have no expertise in whatsoever and serve to uh, reveal the, um, uh, uh, you know, just, just how much of, of this is spam. I mean, a, a anecdote here, the funniest example we had was, um, uh, every now and then like you know one in one in a hundred thousand or something like that there'll be there'll be some instance where something goes wrong at bioarchive and, and, and it misfires and we have to remove something and we actually got an email from a predatory journal that said dear bioarchive we were very interested in your paper file removed because of technical error and we would like to encourage you to submit to our our, our journal which which i thought was absolutely fantastic that's amazing I haven't published in 12 years and I still get invitations to conferences and to be a postdoc in my lab that never existed. And, you know, we, I think, I think we all have to be a bit scrupulous about, about that, but, but still, you know, back to the prestige of journals, if nature came knocking after you put something up on, on bioarchive that not only saves somebody a lot of time with the reformatting and all of the, like, you know, when you go down that journal train, um, if you can just put it in one place and say, let's see if somebody comes to us, the, back to the time savings uh, benefit of and the acceleration of science, there's a, a little piece there. Yeah, uh, I was just fondly remembering uh, technical error because file removed. That was a real page turner. Um, but no, seriously, the, we're thinking about the this new forum, right, for, I guess, being exposed to research for editors uh I, I would i wonder if like you know whatever has a front has a back as they say and in the modern era of like i don't want to call it the gamification but a kind of slight manipulation of people's feelings uh with algorithms and facebook at, at its worst right um but also on every level i think the the kind of the internet as a forum is something that magnifies some things and maybe uh, obscures others. And, and there's no real direct correlation sometimes to whether or not those things have or do not have value. Um, so I, I just wonder, and this follows an example that someone told me who, who remained nameless, who, who kind of gamed uh, the bio archive to draw attention to an article. And I've heard this is not like a, it's, it's not, there's nothing unethical about it. But it just I think it raises some questions. And in, the, in this case, um, the the print went on, the preprint went up um, and then uh, there was a bit of an echo chamber around that because it was shared with, uh, you know, people who were very much against the idea and also collaborators. And within that relatively small sphere of, let's say, 10 researchers, a ton of discourse was created. Um, and that caught the attention of the editors at a major journal. And so they invited my friend, I'll call him, uh, to, to submit. So I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I, it just seems like in that system, you know, when I think of someone like myself who has zero social media presence and is like cringes at the idea of sharing anything because I assume that anything I think is fundamentally wrong, um, that like I would not be so you know, outspoken online. And therefore it becomes, I'll put it differently. It becomes a real important skill for the advancement of your science to be able to promote it, to self-promote. And I don't yeah. know that that's an idea that has not always been there in science, but I think it's a relatively new idea that like, hey, you got to get out there, get it on the preprint and then promote it. And then, you know what I mean? Uh, so I, I guess the, I don't know where the question is in there. I just want your thoughts about the idea of the science and the and the the value of that science from the editorial standpoint being not so much about their own experience and i think it's necessary by the way because these editors can't know everything right so you kind of have to seed to to the if people are talking about it, it must be important i just wonder if that changes uh the game and if you think that's a positive or cha negative change I think I think there are pluses and minuses. I mean, I think on, on the plus side, one of the things that you know social media, for example, um, do is you know they allow 
people to have a voice who didn't necessarily have a voice you know by one of the things i think that was key to success of bioarchive in part was because it, it kind of arrived at a time when there was a lot more peer-to-peer -peer conversation you could go you know i could like never met you before but you could put your paper on twitter and and i could reply to you and say oh that's really interesting but you know had you considered the possibility of this art artifact in your phase separation section or something like that that hadn't happened i could also then you know sort of build some kind of reputation as, as somebody who thinks about this hmm. um and so people would follow me and say oh well you know he's kind of he knows about this stuff so i'll follow him rather than having my interest dictated by who the um, editor had selected to write the news and views articles so i mean i think that's the other thing so, so there's that there is a downside um I mean, because, you know, the most awful aspects of social media, media, um, are, 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 you know, don't omit science, you know, science, the same things happen that it's there, there are phenomena within social media, which are terrible. And, you know, they, they manifest in scientific discussions. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. But I think in terms of, I mean, you talked about sort of selling the work, marketing the work from individual, I mean, people do that a, an awful lot already, right? I mean, we have to, be, you know, um, I mean, many PIs spend their whole time going around the world, North America, giving talks to 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 people. And you know, you know, I mean, I I remember sort of you know talking to a friend of mine once who was saying, oh, I was like, oh, what are you up to over the next couple of weeks? He's like, oh, I've got to got to give a talk at Harvard, then I've got to give a talk at Stanford, then I'm off. And I and I'm like, you don't have to. <laughs> you know this isn't this is not like you know it's like you're doing this because you think that there is value um and there is you know and it, the altruistic um and perhaps like naive perspective is that you know it's beneficial for these people to hear from you you know the more selfish thing is that actually you know this is sustaining my reputation as a as, as a thinker in the field it allows me to market my um, my my opinions and so you know I will say yes to every <laughs> invitation to give a talk because that spreads my scientific brand around the, the country so there's a bit of that anyway and so you know I mean I think you know that there are undoubtedly bad aspects and some of the worst features of these social media platforms are manifest in science as well as discussions of you know football results yeah to your point I think you were putting it mildly. I mean, uh, sometimes some PIs who may or may not have been my own, uh, they'll just bully the editor and say, no, this is important and you're going to send it out for review. And they can only do that because they are a big name. So there's something to be said for democratizing that influence on the editors, because, you know, if people are shouting at each other about it, then at least it's important to to that group right as opposed to just this one craig bentner who's saying yeah it's important send it out and then the reviewers are going to say oh well if they sent it it must be important so it kind of like you know self-sustaining and uh to democratize that i think is one of the again the positive yeah. uh, well, i should emphasize i i you know i have spoken with craig venter on the phone in the past and i should just be very clear he is very courteous and i would not describe him as a, a bully in any way but there are people who are like that to editors. And it's one of the things that you always say to, to, to budding editors and people thinking of it is that, you know, this is one of the, you are saying, you are saying no to a lot of people. You know, if, if you're a nature editor, most of the time you're giving disappointing news to people and they, a lot of them don't like it. And, you know, people can be incredibly aggressive in that and those scenarios. And, and some, some, sometimes you, you do get the, do you know, who I am yeah. um, comes up in the call. My, I never have, have actually said that, but in the back of my mind, I always think I do know who you are, and you're lucky that's not influencing my decision. But yeah, to be clear, Craig Ventner is is not like a bully. I just want to get out there too. <laughs> as a as a former geneticist, genomicist, I can say that I fully appreciate the impact that Craig Ventner has had on the the field. So we'll just we'll just make that clear now. Um, I have two things that are not really related to how we've been flowing this conversation, but I think need to be brought up and I'll, I'll put my person who asked the naive questions hat back on. But I think we need to talk about the funding behind all of this, because we know that 
Uh, BioArchive, you know, obviously has been generously funded by Cold Spring Harbor and the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And if I don't have that right, please correct me. Um, but somebody's paying to host these papers and paying to 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 vet them in the in the way that they are vetted. And um, we know that there's a whole funding apparatus behind and and, and for profit apparatus <laughs> behind the uh, traditional journals that is you know maybe a little undesirable in certain situations. Um, so what what do you, you know, if you're willing to to sort of opine on this situation, how is this going to move forward? Like what if that funding that's backing BioArchive disappeared or what if it's not available to a certain field? Um, how does how does this work in the future? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good question. It's something we think a lot about. Um, uh, I mean, I guess the first thing to say that's really important is in the grand scheme of things, it's not very much. I mean, it's it's the the, 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 the number is, you know, it costs millions of dollars each year to run these things. But the scientific publishing industry is a $10 billion a year industry. Um, you know, it, the APCs for um, uh, for a journal article, which to some extent reflects cost, we, one could argue about that all day, you know, are in the region of sort of three, four thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars a paper. There are two million papers published each year. You know, that's how you get to a billion dollar, multi billion dollar industry. The cost of hosting a preprint um, are tens of dollars, not thousands. So the you know the 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 the, the logic I always say is that you know it's the research costs hundreds of thousands, the journal article costs thousands, the preprint costs tens. So we sh you know I mean I I think it would be a terrible failure of the scientific community if we cannot find tens of dollars for papers. It really is you know the change found at the bottom of the sofa in the in the big in the scheme of things so the question is you know how do you how do you how do you get the tens of dollars per paper to allow you to do this responsible screening and permanent hosting and all the features of bioarchive and and um right now we uh we have generous funding from cold spring harmer and um chan zuckerberg initiative and i you know we i think going forward we want to diversify that have more folks contribute it, it, Personally, it makes far more sense to me to have, you know, a relatively small number of groups that represent the scientific community writing large checks rather than trying to administer, you know, sort of hundreds of thousands of payments of ten per dollar. I mean, we don't we don't want a, a kind of like a customer facing thing where you have to pay to put your paper on bio. We never wanted that. The whole point is that it's free to read. And it's free to post um, and we think that that can be done because the total cost is relatively small in the grand scheme of things you know if you are a funded scientific ecosystem is funding billions of dollars for um for publishing and you know sort of tens hundreds of billions of dollars for all the research um, so we ought to be able to, to, to find that and get a group of funders to say, actually, you know, we can earmark this very small amount of money, relatively speaking, to, 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 to fund this. Um, I think, you know, there's a, then another question about the whole peer review process and what that looks like. Um, but, you know, the, the nice thing about having the kind of preprint ecosystem is that you can take care of that sort of infrastructure piece of the papers. Um, uh, and then, and then have a conversation about how how you fund peer review, how it evolves, as we discussed before, and and who pays, and that's not constrained by by having to cover the hosting of the of the paper online as well. Yeah, I agree with all of that. I think I'd add that yes, the APCs are funding this multi billion dollar industry, but but also the subscription fees, and yeah. um, you know, I think a lot of people in the academic world probably just. Well, I don't know. I want to make the assumption that they just assume that those are paid by somebody because their institution is paying for it. But coming from a small to medium sized biotech world, um, you know, we don't have those that access anymore. As soon as you move into the for profit world, 
you no longer get those academic subscriptions. And really, I would I would argue that science is moving forward with startups, you know, at this point. And startups can't afford to have have uh, and and the subscription fees also go up um, when you're not an academic. So to have subscriptions to these journals and and that's you know coming back to open access and the discussion around open access and who pays but uh, i think we need to really as a as a scientific community do some thinking about how science is accessed and who's paying for it and who's benefiting from it um, and how that money gets distributed absolutely and i think you know i mean I, you know you're totally right i've heard this from a number of small um organizations um uh, biotech that they they can't afford the subscriptions i mean the flip side of course is that people in the nonprofit sector will say for profits should contribute in some way so i mean it would be nice if there'd be nice if there, that, that, that there's some way to contribute without it being this this huge amount i mean you, you know a small biotech company cannot afford to have all the subscriptions that harvard does which will have a you know a multi-million uh, dollar library budget absolutely Absolutely. Okay, we're coming to the end of our time. I would I would love to give you the opportunity to, you know, is there anything we didn't touch on? Anything that you would like to share with the, the community about, you know, what's going on in your mind, what, you know, as you live and breathe this world, what, uh, any last words? Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think the one thing I would, um, I, I always want to underscore is, is the, the value of all this for early career researchers. Um, and I think there's a lot of, you know, and I think, you know, back to that kind of um, hyper competitive prestige economy, that's all kind of fueled by the labor of, um, of young scientists who are in very sort of precarious positions career wise. And I think it's preprints of, uh, uh, afford all sorts of opportunities for them. They can get their work out more quickly. They can get that new job more quickly. They get exposure that they're in control of the timing of. Um, and also because of this sort of evolving phenomenon of people doing peer review of preprints, there's an opportunity for a lot of early career researchers to get involved in that. And I'm particularly enthusiastic about that because, you know, I was one of those people many years ago who chose not to go on and become an academic. And then you go to a job interview and they say, okay, well, what can you do? And you say, well, you know, I can run STS page and I can sequence stuff. And, you know, I'm not going to be doing that in my new job. And, you know, and here I've got a PhD thesis that you're not going to read. Um, and it would be kind of nice to have a bunch of other things, a bunch of peer reviews that I had and I could make public and I could say, hey, look, you know, I read across all these other fields, you know, I am I can talk about other things. And I, so I've, I've always thought that this whole notion of preprint peer review is something that is, is of a lot of potential benefit for young scientists, those who are gonna stay in science and those who are gonna move out of um, bench work um, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Accessibility, accessibility across all sectors, you know, um, of who can contribute to science and who can, uh, who gets a seat at the table. I think that open access is is one of the keys to to providing that. Daylon, any final words from you? Well, just uh, following up on that thought, I mean, I, I would just say, I, not mission accomplished, but you've certainly normalized the the idea of preprint. And and when I was a trainee. I wouldn't, it would be like confusion, you know, what you want me to just share the work. And I think that nowadays it's almost implicit that while waiting for the work to reach a point of maturity, uh, that it, it's not going to bounce around and review forever, uh, after the preprint, um, that, yeah, it's, it's important to get it out there for your own benefit and particularly to the benefit of of young scientists. I mean, I think that's the thing. Any resistance comes from these legacy scientists for whom this whole notion of, you know, getting scooped in prestige journals and hyper competitive economy uh, is baked in. So yeah, it's 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 gonna take this younger generation of scientists to to change the paradigm. And I think that they're a really important step that that you've made in the past decade plus, whatever it's been is that, yeah, there's zero resistance. 
to the idea of preprints nowadays, which I could have never predicted. I would have never predicted that in such a short time, people could have such a different notion of that when it's like a, going from self-preservation, looking over your shoulder to like a open science economy. I wouldn't say we're there yet, in the open science economy, but at least it's not anathema. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you for making your impact and um, you know, doing what we all thought was, was impossible, which is you know, shaking up the publication industry and making things more accessible. Um, that brings us to the end of our episode. Thank you so much, Dr. Richard Sever. Uh, please, everybody, check out his recent paper in PLOS Biology and uh, find him online. There's a few other talks uh, that are really fascinating, and we really appreciate you being here today. Okay, that brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to sign up for our email list at www.labcoatsandlifepodcast.com to get show notes, episode summaries, and links to useful information or learn more about STEM mentorship via the resources at www.stemcell.com slash labcoatsandlife. You can also reach out to us on Twitter via stemcell at stemcelltech or by email at info at labcoatsandlifepodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests.